the Old Time Gospel Hour, Program 476, regular version. Welcome to Liberty Mountain. And behind me you can see the Liberty Baptist College where some 5,000 young people now attend the college and the various schools, training to be champions for Christ. This is a special mountain to us. We're just finishing 10 years, phase one, and this program today is a very important program to watch. Because during these 60 minutes, for the very last time ever, I'll be asking you to stake your claim on Liberty Mountain. I want you to be a part owner of the mountain. I want you to help us continue the miracle of Liberty Mountain. And though there are 5,000 kids here now from 50 states and 29 nations, one day we're asking God to give us 50,000 students in a Christian university, young people who can effectively change the course of history. This is your last chance to stake your claim on Liberty Mountain. Now to the service at Thomas Road Church in progress. From the auditorium of the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, the faith partners and friends present Jerry Falwell and the Old Time Gospel Hour, celebrating 25 years of Christian ministry. You may be seated. How Pastor Dr. Falwell. Thank you, Jim Moon. Today, from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, a part of the Sermon on the Mount, I'm speaking on the subject Judge not that you be not judged. That's Matthew chapter 7, and that is our message for today. Also, today is the very last time we will be asking friends anywhere and everywhere. Stake your claim on Liberty Mountain. And the reason why our toll-free number will be up throughout the program today is because we need to go over the top. We need to, we need to find those 50,000 friends who will each claim one one-hundredth of an acre on Liberty Mountain. Stake your claim there by calling our toll-free number, becoming part owner with us of a continuing miracle we have over 5,000 students this year at Liberty Baptist College and schools. One day we're going to have 50,000 training young champions to turn our nation around and give the gospel to a world of four and one half billion souls in this our generation. It's going to be an exciting day and I'm asking God to keep our toll free lines busy as our friends everywhere at this final opportunity, the final hour, stake their claim on Liberty Mountain. Right now, David Ranlett and the Old Time Gospel Hour Choir come to sing for us.
Scripture so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the waters cool flow, may the weary one feet, God leads his dear children along. smallest Bible in the world. What do you think it looks like? As a matter of fact, I have on my person right now, and this is an absolute statement of truth, the smallest Bible in the world. I have it in my shirt pocket. It's inside this little folder. Now, I'm not talking about selected verses from the Bible. I'm not talking about a a text from Genesis and a text from Exodus and a text from the Psalms. I'm talking about all 1,189 chapters on the Bible. Cal Thomas, how many words in the Bible? <laughs> he said 4 billion to, uh, There are 773,746 words in the English Bible. Write that down, Cal. <laughs> Give that to NBC if you would. 773,746 words in the English Bible. In the particular English Bible, King James Version, from which this smallest Bible was taken, there were 1,245 pages photographed and reduced by 62,500 to one. Now let me show it to you. Inside is the smallest Bible in the world, about one square inch. Can you read any of the text from where you are there? <laughs> Here is the smallest Bible in the world. And in that one square inch approximately are 1,245 pages, 1,189 chapters, 66 books, 773,746 words. It's on microfilm. They call it, NCR calls it microform. And we have obtained enough of them to give one per household to everyone who dials our toll-free number. You say, what can I do with it? Well, you can put it like I do in my pocket and carry it with you. I don't pull it out and read it on the plane, <laughs> but I'm glad to know that I have a copy of the Word of God very close to my heart all the time. Secondly, it's a wonderful way to ensure the fact that no one in this century or the next or the next will ever eliminate the Word of God from the face of the earth. 
because with a student's microscope of 100 power or more, you can read it right off the microform. Every word of it. Would have been great if Red China and Russia and Christians in those days could have had this when the communists took over. They couldn't have destroyed the Bibles. They wouldn't have to be smuggling them back in now. And more than that, it's just a good conversation piece to pull out of your billfold, fellas, if you have it stuck back there, ladies, your pocketbook, or out of your shirt pocket at coffee break time with the plan of the office and say, that is the smallest Bible in the world, and a good soul-winning conversation begins. Regardless for the reason you might like to have this little Bible, just dial the toll-free number 1-800-446-5000. All of you write it down. Now, you can't dial that if you live in Virginia, Hawaii, Alaska, or Canada. You need to write me, Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, or in Canada, Box 505, Richmond Hill, Ontario, to get the smallest Bible in the world. But whether you are calling or writing, just ask for one copy of the smallest Bible in the world, and only one copy per household, please. I'll mail it to you, and I'll mail it to you inside this little packet right here, just like that. And, and, and the whole story of how it was reduced and, and uh, the entire process is described in, on the package. So dial me on our toll-free number here in Lynchburg, Virginia, and one of the Liberty Baptist students or staff members will answer the call. Simply say, I want one copy of the smallest Bible in the world. We'll mail it to you today. And then don't ever let me catch you anywhere without it. It's like the Jesus First lapel pen. You have the smallest Bible in the world with you everywhere you go. Call us right now. We took over 10,000 telephone calls last Sunday, one day. That's a lot of phone calls. And when you're taking 10,000, I suspect we'll get 15,000 this week, telephone calls a day, and shipping these out as fast as you can, and many are writing for it. It means a lot of copies of the Word of God are going out. We have the busiest 800 number system in the world every day. So dial us and let us send you a free copy of the smallest Bible in the world. Here's the Pantana family coming to sing for us at this time. As the Pantanas come, I want to remind all of you that a good place to be on, is it the second week in December, Living Christmas Tree, the second weekend? Does anybody have the exact dates? I'm sure we're all guessing. 11, 12, and 13. Look that up. You're positive that's correct. There's no question about it. All right, uh, Dave Randlett and the entire choir and Don Norman say it's December 11, 12, and 13. Chances are it's wrong. But that's December 11, 12, and 13, the living Christmas tree in Lynchburg, Virginia. The reason I knew the first statement wasn't right was because Phil told me it was December 6, 7, and 8. I said, no, that can't be right. And uh, what did you, that's last, that's 1980. That's last yes, that's fine. <laughs> he has his calendar with him. And he's going to sing one of last year's songs now, the Pantana family. <laughs> my soul a message he wants me to know his spirit of divine fills this sinful soul hallelujah when god tips his love in my heart tell it to a living soul how he brought salvation when he made me whole but i found the good height such love as jesus did in it makes me laugh, laugh and it makes me cry, sets my sinful soul. Hallelujah, when God takes his love in my heart. He walked every step of Calvary's rugged way to give his life completely and bring a better day. My life was steeped in sin, but in love he took me. Hallelujah, his, his blood washed away every stain. Well, I said I wouldn't tell it to a living soul how he brought salvation when he made me whole. But I found I couldn't hide such love as Jesus did in Because it makes me laugh and it makes me cry. Sets my sinful soul alive. Hallelujah, when God dips his love in my heart. Love as 
Well, here we are again on Liberty Mountain. I'm standing on the lower campus where 34 buildings have been erected the last four years. And behind me, you can see the upper campus, we call it phase two, where one day schools of law, medicine, engineering, etc., will be developed and 50,000 students in a Christian university will be in attendance. It's all a dream, but this was a dream 10 years ago when the school started with zero students. And now there are over 5,000 young people. We are asking our friends everywhere to be a part of a miracle, and today, as I told you earlier, is the last opportunity ever you can participate in staking your claim on Liberty Mountain. I may have shocked you five weeks ago. You saw the for sale sign, Liberty Mountain for sale, and that was because of a $5 million indebtedness that we wanted to pay off and move on to phase two. So we sectioned off 500 acres for that purpose, inviting our friends to stake your claim on Liberty Mountain. The following week, I tried to show you as graphically as possible what a 21 by 21 foot plat of property looks like. Don Norman and the Sounds of Liberty stood right there in the middle of that plat of property and sang, I've been on the mountain. And then three weeks ago, I took you on a drive around Liberty Mountain. We began at the multi-purpose building and I took you around the completed buildings of phase one and then on to where phase two will ultimately be erected. The following week, you saw an old time gospel hour special program from the chapel of Liberty Baptist College. I took you on a brief 10 year historical segment and showed you that meeting when we with the pastors just weeks ago unveiled the 25 year master plan for this ministry, our vision for the future of this outreach. Last week, as our Thanksgiving special, with Religious Liberty, the theme, I took you to Louisville, Nebraska, on the lawn of the Faith Baptist Church. And here we are back on Liberty Mountain. This is the lower campus. We call it Phase One. The last four years, all 34 of these buildings have been erected. And this section right here is part of the 500 acres we have cut out to sell. This is part of the 500 acres. These are girls' dorms. The deans call it no man's land. And here uh, and behind me, phase two, are the 500 one-acre tracks. Each of them has 100 plats inside it. That is, one one-hundredth of an acre is a plat. And we're trying to find 50,000 persons. And today's the last day ever we're going to do that. 50,000 persons who will just call us and stake your claim on one plat. I wish I could bring you to Lynchburg and show you what I'm seeing here and what I every day am a part of. Phase one has taken 10 years. We've invested about $100 million in what we've done already. And uh, we, we thank God for the privilege of doing that. When you consider 5,000 students are here from all 50 states and 29 foreign countries and the four schools, when you consider one day we're going to have 50,000 students on these 4,000 acres called Liberty Mountain. Uh, you get a sense of the miracle, the supernatural that's occurring on this place. It is indeed a miracle place. And in these 4,000 acres, there'll be schools of law, medicine, engineering. It's going to be a university to train young people to change the world. Liberty, Baptist College and Schools. And you, my friend, are a part of it. And that's why one more time I've brought you to Liberty Mountain. These are the girls' dorms were built four years ago, but over my shoulder, you can see the brand new three-story brick dorms that have just gone up this year and just now occupied. Classrooms, buildings, way up there, the little spire of our country church, the little prayer chapel. A brand new red brick classroom building just now ready for occupancy. On and on, the miracle continues. And although we can't show you the buildings on the upper campus yet, we can see them, just like we saw these four years ago because God has promised to help us build a Christian university here. And you are, I repeat, a very important part of that dream. 
America can be turned around. We can get the gospel out to the world. There's no question about it. And we've spent $100 million here already and raised 95% of it. We're simply trying to raise another $5 million to conclude phase one, finish this year out of the red, and I'm asking you to help me do it. That is why we have sectioned off 500 acres into 500 one-acre tracts of land. Inside each one acre, 100 plats. I want you to stake your claim on one plat. I want you to call our toll-free number and tell the Liberty Baptist College student or staff member who answers, I want to stake my claim on Liberty Mountain. I want to become a part owner. Make your pledge. Pledge $100, which you can give $10 a month for the next 10 months or all at once, or maybe you want to pledge on a quarter acre for $2,500 or a half acre for $5,000 or maybe one whole acre for $10,000. Just call and make your pledge. Do it right now. This is the last time ever we're going to ask you to help us in this project and the last opportunity you'll have to stake your claim on this sacred mountain of 4,000 acres. When we get your call, we'll send you this beautiful folder which says on the front, we have staked our claim on Liberty Mountain. Placed on your coffee table, or desk and opened. First, there's a letter inside from me to you thanking you for staking your claim on Liberty Mountain. And then there's a symbolic deed. We retain legal ownership to the property, of course, because we've built on it and will be building on it. But in a symbolic spiritual way, you will have staked your claim on a particular acre and plat. And you'll be able to come here and read the directory one day and find the approximate location of that one plat that 21 by 21 plat that you staked your claim on. More important than that, you'll be helping us to bail out, to conclude phase one, to come out of the red. And I'm looking for 50,000 people who will do it. I'm asking you to be one of them. Dial the number right now. And the Liberty Baptist student or staff member will take your name and address. We'll mail you the folder. We'll send you the symbolic deed. And you will either with a cash gift now or a pledge you'll pay over the next few months, you'll be staking your claim on Liberty Mountain. If you live in Virginia, Hawaii, Alaska, or Canada, that telephone number on the screen will not work for you. You need to write me, Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, 24514. If you live in Canada, Box 505, Richmond Hill, Ontario. And uh, when you write or call, uh, just take your claim. If you're writing and you're enclosing a check, make your check payable to the Old Time Gospel Hour. It's tax deductible and mark it for the Stake Your Claim program. I hope to get your call today. We need your help. This is the last day of the Stake Your Claim campaign. I've brought you here to Liberty Mountain. I've shown you phase one, these 34 buildings, and a few more will be added to it. And then we move across the street across the highway to phase two and the development of the Christian University. I need for you to claim one acre or a half acre or a quarter acre or even one plat with your pledge. So call me, make your pledge, join the team and be part of a miracle. I'm looking for your call. I hope we'll reach victory today. Now back to the Thomas Road Church, the service in progress. Sin was my master with death as wages. I was caught in the clutches of guilt and shame. But then, then Jesus came and loosed my sorrow. No more sin can freely
Jesus the Resurrection. Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 7. That's page 1414 in the Faith Partner Study Bible. Beginning with verse 1, Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount, continued from the last two weeks. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the, unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. I'm going to ask Dr. Dwayne Gish of the Institute for Creation Research in San Diego to come and lead us in prayer. Dr. Dwayne Gish. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come to Thee now at this hour asking for understanding. And Father, we know we must also pray for humility because it is only in a humble spirit that we can receive thy word and your instruction. So, Father, we pray that you'll keep us humble, you'll keep us our hearts open, our minds open and clear. Father, give us a desire for the word of God. Give us an understanding. Father, may we desire to understand and to know more about thy word, your instruction, this holy word of God. So Father, now we just pray that this will be a time of learning, a time of blessing, a time of instruction, and that we will carry it with us and give testimony of what you have done in our own lives and what you have done for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we give you all the honor and the praise in his precious name, amen. amen. The Sermon on the Mount, which our Lord delivered nearly 2,000 years ago, will provide the constitution, the basic constitution of the government that shall prevail on this earth during the 1,000-year reign of Christ when he sits down upon the throne of David in Jerusalem. That will occur, that is, the establishment of the millennial reign of Christ, the kingdom of Christ on earth, 
following the rapture of the church, the church and the seven years of tribulation, consummating with the battle of Armageddon. Then he, Christ, will come with tens of thousands of his saints, and we shall rule and reign with him on this earth for 1,000 years. That's why we're not so concerned about where the MX missiles are, and, and we're not so concerned about the nuclear arms race. That's why we haven't joined any of the marches and demonstrations at the nuclear power sites, uh, because we happen to believe the Bible, and the Bible teaches clearly that this earth is going to be used by God for people, as it now is, for at least 1,007 more years, if the Lord should come today. And that uh, makes it impossible for the despots and the communist dictators to ever do anything to God's creation. The one thing they don't realize is that the king's heart, even the wicked king's heart, is in the hand of the Lord, our Lord. And as the rivers of water, he, God, turns it whithersoever he will. And we can be confident in that and rest peacefully each night knowing that the whole world is in his hands and everything's under control. There are no panic buttons near the throne, and if there were one, he isn't leaning toward it. Everything's under control. A second definition for the Sermon on the Mount is that we have here a word picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything the Sermon on the Mount is, Christ is. And finally, the Sermon on the Mount is the life of Jesus Christ that God, by the indwelling Holy Spirit, within every believer, desires to live out through us individually. The world is to see Christ in us as this Sermon on the Mount is lived out through us daily. In the past two weeks, we have talked about chapters 6, uh, 5 and 6, and now we come to chapter 7. It begins with Phariseeism. When our Lord says, judge not that you be not judged. Because he said, how can you behold the little splinter, the toothpick that's in your brother's eye and not see the telephone pole that's in your own eye? That's Falwell translation, but that is exactly what he's saying here. How can you see the little, uh, the, the little moat in your brother's eye and you can't see the beam, verse 3, in your own eye? First of all, we're warned against Phariseeism. We're warned against self-righteousness, a holier-than-thou-art attitude. People don't get saved because they stop sinning. They stop sinning because they've been saved. Uh, people don't get uh, more spiritual because they don't drink or chew or spit or whatever. Uh, because Christ lives in them, the Christ life is manifested through them, and day by day the word sanctification becomes a reality that is, we're more like Jesus. We're being conformed into the image of God's dear Son. Phariseeism. May God deliver us as Bible-believing Christians from this sin. Phariseeism. I see so much of it in the churches today. Uh, one reason why we've been so slow in making an impact upon our society is because Bible-believing conservative Christians have spent so much time infighting, criticizing one another, knocking each other, finding out what the other Christian camp is doing that we don't agree with, and then spending all of our energy and resources attacking that group of brothers and sisters. Hey, the enemy is not inside the family of God. The enemy is out yonder. The enemy are those secular humanists, those, those pornographers, those abortionists, uh, those Marxists, those antichrist uh, uh, persons, all kinds of groups out there. Uh, and they're not all the same. One might be... Uh, living a very libertarian type life and at the same time be committed to the flag and to the nation. So we're simply saying there are all kinds of people out there who hate Christ, who hate everything the Bible stands for and who want to see the cause of Christ destroyed. That's the enemy and it's headed up by Satan himself. There are only two forces in the world, the forces of Christ and the forces of Satan. And the great controversy has always been Christ versus Belial. We just happen to represent one or the other. And those who belong to the family of God represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who hate this Bible and, and who hate the church and who hate believers are those who are marching under the leadership of the other fellow, Lucifer himself. And so we don't need to be attacking the brethren. May God give us a spiritual harmony during this decade among believers. I'm not talking about ecumenism. Anybody who knows me, knows that I'm a fundament, uh, fundamentalist, I'm a separatist. I believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, the deity of Christ, which includes His virgin birth. I believe in holy living. I 
believe in all the traditional doctrines of traditional Christianity. At the same time, there are a lot of people who know the Lord Jesus who are not Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterians or Nazarenes. It's sort of hard to get believers to understand that God has some of His people planted everywhere. But it's true. And we need to be very sensitive and careful about that so that while we are dealing with systems and with sin in general, we are not attacking saints who may be in a particular system. I believe in separatism, and I believe we should come out from the world and be separate. But at the same time, there's no question in my heart and mind that Phariseeism never helps anybody up. We don't need to be printing pamphlets on the 57 sins that send people to hell. There's only one sin that sends anybody to hell, and that's rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's the only sin that sends to hell. The only sin. And we don't need to be attacking people for what they're doing wrong. Judge not that you be not judged. Let's ask God to deliver us from that. Many of our pastors spend half their pulpit time talking about another brother, another preacher, another church. Those of you who've been with me for 25 years since we founded this congregation in 1956, you know that I have never, nor do I ever allow anyone in this pulpit to attack another brother in Christ. I may not agree with this preacher or that evangelist. I may not agree with cooperative evangelism practiced by some. I may not agree with the methods and so on, but I never, never, never use the pulpit to attack a brother. And I think that we ought to, in our churches, in our Christian schools, we ought to teach the principles. We ought to keep our own house clean. We ought to establish the, the rules of behavior for our ministry and our family and our church. But we shouldn't try to do the same for others. And we should realize that spirituality is not measured in rules and regulations. One's relationship to God, one's intimacy with, in fellowship with Christ is not based upon what he does or doesn't do, where he goes or doesn't go. The second thing that our Lord deals with in verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Sometimes we not only are pharisaical, that is self-righteous, but we allow the pharisaism to be displayed before an unsaved, unregenerate world. Whenever the press asks me, what do you think about so-and-so? Usually some preacher said something out there, or some preacher's done this, or some evangelist or pastor said this. You know what my answer always is? God leads us all differently. God has led me to do what I'm doing, and I'm sure that brother feels that God is leading him to do what he's doing. He may not agree with everything I say and do, and I may not agree with everything he says and do or does, but I will never, never, never in public criticize my brother. If I happen not to disagree with him, and you don't know whether I do or don't, and when I see him in private, if I don't, I'll share it with him from a heart of love. I'll never cast my pearl before swine. That's one reason why I didn't uh, want to, for my interview, uh, which uh, I would never give an interview to a pornographic magazine, I didn't want my interview earlier this year to appear in a pornographic magazine. Oh, somebody said, listen, look how many sinners read that thing. That's all right. But I believe verse... Six applies here. Cast not your pearl before swine. I believe that if they sold one magazine because of my name, that I should speak out against that. Pornographic magazines are not a good platform for the sublime gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't sometimes cause the wrath of men to praise Him. I think that God glorified Himself through it because as the verse in Genesis 50 where the brethren of Joseph found him in Egypt and Joseph, they had attempted to kill him, you know. They tried to kill him once. Uh, Joseph, when he had a chance to show mercy, he did. And they were all so thankful. And Joseph said, hey, fellas, what you did, you meant for evil, but God meant it for good. Those fellows at the pornography smut machine did it for evil. They meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. And so... He can always, if our hearts are right, turn it around. I noticed that uh, Billy Carter is going to begin writing a column for We Magazine. And his first article is Jerry Falwell. Well, God bless Brother Billy. <laughs> Give not that which is holy unto dogs, 
Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So don't try to spiritualize the world. The third thing is found in verse 7 and following. Ask, it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. Don't be guilty of Phariseeism. Don't be, be guilty of casting your pearl before swine or spiritualizing the world. And number three, don't be guilty of prayerlessness. What's the number one sin in the church? You say it's materialism. I think ahead of that it's prayerlessness. I think if our church has prayed enough, we wouldn't be victimized by materialism. I think it's prayerlessness. We don't pray enough. Nothing of eternal importance ever happens apart from prayer. Nothing. Until we have prayed, God will not work. It isn't a question that God cannot work. God can do anything. But God has personally restricted Himself. Ask, it shall be given you. And then James 4, 2, you have not. Why? Because you ask not. If you don't ask, God isn't going to do it. Learn how to pray. Learn how to get things from God. And we're told by the Lord Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount not to be self-righteous, not to try to mix with the world and be a part of that which is heathen, and at the same time learn how to pray the power of God down upon your life and upon others. Learn how to pray and get things from God. If as a young convert you can learn how to pray and get things from God, you can change the course of history. Dr. Francis Schaeffer told our students, he challenged them to effectively change the course of history, to significantly redirect history. And it can happen. Newsweek magazine. I'm not going to preach from Newsweek this morning, so don't get shook up. But there's an article in Newsweek magazine under the television heading which tells about the new television season that's just now coming out. Headline, Hello Mayhem, Goodbye Sex. Subheading, The Strike Delayed Fall Season Promises Cops, Private Eyes, Old Faces, and New Fantasy, All Squeaky Clean. Then it goes on to tell how they've swept the sex back into the closet. Might be fit for human consumption this year. You know why? Primarily because millions of God-fearing Americans stood up and said, We've had it right up to here and told the sponsors, we're not going to buy your products if you don't tell the three networks to get television back to some reasonable uh, level of sanity, moral sanity. And you know what? A few million dollars will co cover a multitude of theology. Those fellows just began to change their convictions up at the networks, and now we've got clean. We're going to have clean programming this year. I'm not sure they're happy about it, but it's a fact. It's happening. And if God's people will continue to pray and take their stand, we can have clean newsstands and clean television screens and clean movie screens. Now you say it's going to make a lot of people mad. So what? We ought to be mad. We ought to be the ones who are mad. This is a nation under God. This nation wasn't built by intellectual elitist or secular humanist or, or, or amoral humanist. This nation wasn't built by the television producers and script writers. This nation was built by godly men and women on godly principles. This is a nation under God. We let them take it away from us. We're not trying to hurt anybody. We're just taking back what belongs to us so that our children and our children's children will have a country that's fit to live in. Well, the rest of the article goes on to tell the story. One fellow, you know, Tony Randall really had a fit the other day. Somebody mentioned to him he was to play a part of a homosexual in a TV series where they adopt a child and that kind of thing. And uh, when somebody mentioned to him earlier this year that some Christians might not like that, uh, he had some very choice comments to make. I noticed that NBC, NBC has neutered him. He's, uh, he's not homosexual anymore. That's wonderful how you can just make the decision and straighten out. And now it may be a fine program, who knows? And it goes right on to tell the story that uh, television is moving back towards decency, where mom and dad and the children can watch a night of TV and mom and dad can go out to the grocery store and leave the children there without wondering what they're going to see or hear. Now, I'm not sure that's true. You check it out carefully before you take that as the gospel. Newsweek said it's squeaky clean. It may be, it may not be. That's not uh, the fifth gospel, so you need to check that one out for yourself and make your own decision. 
But we do in this country at least see that the people of God, without being pharisaical and without mixing up with the world, can get involved in society through prayer, through witness, through consistency, and maybe change the world a little bit for the better. And it's beginning to happen. Well, in verse 12, Jesus said, Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Some call this the golden rule. Uh, I just have written here fair play. God wants us to learn how to pray. And he wants to, to teach us how to treat people fairly. Someone said the other day the golden rule is that he who has the gold makes the rules. Well, that may be true in the world, but it shouldn't be true in the way we live. Every one of us should treat people lovingly and graciously, no matter who they are, what they have or don't have. We should not be conscious about the kind of clothing they're wearing. James deals with that, you know. He says when a fellow walks into your church and uh, he's dressed up very handsomely and has on jewelry and he appears to be a wealthy person and you bring him down to the best seat, and someone walks in ra rather shabbily attired and who appears to be in poverty and you put him in the back seat, you've offended God because God is no respecter of persons. At Thomas Road Baptist Church, I'm thankful for this. This morning, we had little children. We picked up on the buses that we had to buy shoes for them so they could come out in the cold weather. And we have Cadillacs parked out on the parking lot and professional people. And, and I'm glad in the same church, the rich and the poor can sit down together and the professional people and the little barefooted children can sit down together because the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. There are no special people with God. We're all His children if we've trusted His Son Jesus as our Savior. And thank God, fair play does prevail. And then verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. He warns us about following the crowd. You know, everybody will help you when they find out you've won. It's amazing. I've been in some bloody battles the last few years. I mean, you name it. Uh, we, we just um, went out to Louisville, Nebraska, where the State Department of Education had padlocked a little country church. Their crime, they had a little Christian school with 19 students in it. They have 20 other non-licensed uh, schools in that state, Christian schools, not licensed by the State Department of Education because of conviction. Only eight states now require that, and that'll soon be zero states because it isn't constitutional. The First Amendment says that government, including the Congress, shall not establish a state religion or prohibit the free exercise of religion. And we believe that parents own children, not the state. And that if parents want their children in a Christian school or a Jewish school or a Catholic school or a fundamentalist school or a Protestant school or a Seventh-day Adventist school or a Mormon school, that's the parents' business. And all the state can do is guarantee that it's healthy, that there's no fire hazard, that the atmosphere is clean, but the curriculum, the philosophy is none of the state's business. We had to go out there because that State Department of Education decided that they know better what those children need. And they padlocked the church door, the little country church in Louisville, Nebraska, because the school was meeting in the church. Well, we couldn't let that stay. Not only do we have to ring the bell of those bureaucrats who are trying to make this Soviet Russia instead of the U.S., we had to ring the bell for the whole nation so that in case there's a bureaucrat in somebody else's state somewhere, nobody would ever try that again. Why, if they ever padlock a synagogue or a church in this country, every God-fearing American ought to be there the next morning to jerk it off. Absolutely. We can't have that in this country. And I'd bless your heart as long as I'm living, we're not going to have it. And uh, I can always stir up enough crowd to make <laughs> enough dust that nobody wants it. Uh, I've, uh, you know, there are enough Lester Olofs and Jack Hiles and Jerry Falwells around and Lee Robertsons and so on that uh, we can always get a crowd. To, to protest the oppression of religious freedom in this country. We're not going to have it. Well, don't follow the crowd. It's real easy when uh, after everybody knows you've won, they'll come and say, I was with you all the time. Bless God, I wish I'd had you three months ago. I looked around and wasn't anybody there. Bloody, tough, rough. The newspapers. I wish some of you guys would come on up because 
the, the press needs to write about somebody else once in a while. There's just not much more they can dig up on me. I've only lived 48 years. I've only, you know, had 365 days a year. And there's just so much they can make up and write. Well, thank God they are standing up everywhere. Thank God for the preachers and the parents in this country who love God who have taken their stand. And there's just so many of us. You can cuss us and call us what you want to, but when the dust settles, we're still there. And we have a few more all the time. Growing, growing, starting four new Christian schools in America every day. Planning 5,000 new fundamentalist churches in North America between now and the end of this century, the next 19 years. Finally, verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly they are ravening wolves. You know who our number one problem people are in this country? You say the Democrats? No. The Republicans? No. The liberals? No. The liberal clergymen. God bless these liberal clergymen who have a, a piece of jelly for a backbone, don't know what they believe and don't believe what they know, and uh, who wouldn't preach against sin if it, uh, whatever it might uh, be the cause or the reason for fear of offending somebody. And uh, these fellows who want to be on everybody's bandwagon. When you take a stand for truth, it's usually going to be a lonely stand. And there may not be anybody there but you for a while, and then just a little handful, and they are a despised crowd. God didn't call us preachers to be popular. He called us to be right. And if we'll stick by this book, we'll be right. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, to die upon a cross, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves people, and God's looking for preachers and Christians who will tell the world about a Jesus, an uncompromising Jesus who set His face toward the cross and who died that all men might have life. That's why we're training those students at Liberty Baptist College. That's why we're asking you to stake your claim on Liberty Mountain. That's why for this last time we're asking you to call us and help us build a 50,000 student university, uh, university out there one day on Liberty Mountain to train the champions who can turn the nation around. Shall we pray? While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, how many of you right now will say, I am a Christian, I am saved, I know I'm saved. If I die in the next 30 minutes, I'm as sure for heaven as if I were already there, saved for sure forever. Raise your hand, please. God bless you. If you couldn't lift your hand, you don't know Christ, right there in the seat or by the television set, will you bow your head and say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Invite Jesus into your heart. And by television, just, just write me and tell me of the decision you've made. I'll send you a free copy of the material we give to those who walk down the aisles here, how to get started right, to help you live the life you've received. If you still have questions about your salvation, J.O. Grooms and other soul-winning pastors will call you at our expense if you'll give me your telephone number. If you have a prayer request, we'll pray for you by name, by need. Write and tell me about it. We'll answer you personally. If you want counseling, call the prayer hotline. Someone is by the phone 24 hours a day. If you're deaf and you have a physical emergency, the University of Virginia Crisis Center can help you. If you have a spiritual need, we have counselors here. It's an 800 TTY number. We can help you. Let's stand, please, to pray. Heavenly Father, help men and women, boys and girls, to do now what they'll be glad they've done when they stand in your presence one day. Save that soul that is nearest hell. Reclaim backsliders. Heal broken hearts. Put broken families back together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want every soul winner to pray. I want every person in this building who needs Jesus as Savior, every one of you who needs to rededicate your life to the Lord, everyone who'd like to join the Thomas Road Baptist Church today, upstairs and down, I want you to come. And I want you to let Jesus Christ have his way in your heart and life upstairs and down, every man, woman, boy, and girl with a spiritual need. While we sing right now, our pastors are here to meet you. Come while we wait on you.
You have been watching the Old Time Gospel Hour originating from the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. If you would like an audio cassette of today's program, write to Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, 24514, and enclose a $4 donation. Request program number 476. To become a faith partner and receive this beautiful faith partner Bible, call toll-free 1-800-446-5000 for complete information. Once again, that free number is 1-800-446-5000. Now, this is John Corrigan inviting you to join us next week for another telecast of the Old Time Gospel Hour. And until then, may God richly bless you is our prayer. This has been a presentation of the Liberty Broadcasting System.